Welcome to my course, Game Development Basics, Week 8, Lesson 5, Bug Squash Updates. In the last lesson, we talked through the procedural level generation for this level in our game Bug Squash, but we can actually see that there's quite a few other changes that have been made since we left the project in Week 2. So I want to spend some time doing a demo of the game with all these changes and then we'll break everything down and show you the implementation of these features. So one of the first things is we'll notice that we're when we're just sitting at this menu, the camera is rotating around the player to show the level. When I press start game, it's going to zoom out and set the view for the player while doing a countdown. And then the wave will start. It's gonna spawn some bugs into the level. And when all of these bugs are defeated, the wave will stop. We also notice that the bugs are dropping some cubes, and when I pick those up, the number of credits in the bottom left-hand corner is going up. There's a tower in the middle of the level that I left because I wanted it to be a tie back to where we left the lesson off in week two. But we'll also notice that we have a tank that we're moving around the level, and there's a cursor on the screen that shows where the tank will be firing the bullets and the turret is following that cursor around. So wherever that cursor is, that's where the bullet will be fired. When we go to the tower in the center, we see a menu pop up that says E to interact. And we can press E and say buy tower and it shows us 750 with this symbol that I just thought looked interesting so I used it to signify credits. And when I select that, the view zooms out and I'm given an option to choose a location where I can spawn a new tower. And when I select it, the turret is in the level and I can also interact with that. When I start the next wave, this turret will also attempt to target enemies. And the enemies will also go after turrets if they're closer in location. So we can see there that some of the enemies are trying to go after the turret. Some of them are trying to go after the tower and some are trying to go after the player. Now, when I interact with the turret, I can heal it back to full health between each wave. And then I can interact by another tower, place that one in the level, and then I can start the next wave. So now it's starting to feel much more like a traditional tower defense game where you're building towers and trying to defend the main base while enemies are being spawned into the level. And each wave that passes, more and more enemies are being spawned into the level and the hope is that the player can try to build defenses to try to keep up with the enemies being spawned and get as far into the game as possible. So let's break all of this down. The first place I wanted to start was by implementing the new control system. So you can see here that I have a new input mapping context called IMC tank, and I have my mappings here, IA move, which is WASD, I have fire cannon, which is set to my left mouse button, interact, which is set to E, and then an event called escape, which is set to escape. And here on my tank controller, all I'm doing is just getting my player and controller, getting the enhanced input local player subsystem, making sure it's valid, and then adding IMC tank to the mapping context of that subsystem. So this will allow us to use the enhanced input system. And I changed from player tower, I created a new actor called BP tank base, and this is of type character. And in here, I have a few different elements. I have my capsule component, which comes with the character. I have my spring arm and camera. I have my bottom mesh, which is the tank tracks. And then I have this turret mesh that has a static mesh for the gun and then an arrow component that I'm using as the muzzle. On begin play, we're getting our game mode and I'm gonna set that as a variable. Here in the tick, we have two functions. One of them is to rotate tank tracks and one of them is to rotate turret. Rotate tank tracks gets the velocity of our actor, gets the vector length and checks if it's greater than zero. If it is, we're gonna get a rotation from X vector break that and get just the Z, and then set that to the rotation of the mesh, which is our tracks. And this means that the tracks are always gonna face in the direction that the tank is moving. 
rotate turret is changed just a little bit from where we left off. I felt like it was a little bit sluggish the way it worked before. So I created this new function and I have these crosshairs that I can point on the map and the turret is always going to rotate to be in the direction of those crosshairs. And I feel like this is a little bit more responsive and more like what the player of a game like this would expect. And for this, really all we had to do was get player controller and get hit result under cursor by channel and then get that hit result location. And then we're gonna get our turret and get world location and then find look at rotation with the starting point of where the turret currently is and a target point of wherever our cursor is. Then we're gonna get our turret and we're gonna set world rotation to that new Z rotation. And I feel like this is a much cleaner implementation and much more responsive for the player. There's one more check here, and this is a check to make sure that we're not in a menu before we do this rotation, and we'll cover this in a bit. For the movement, I wanted the player to be able to move around in the level. So I set this up in my IMC to WASD, and this is giving us a 2D vector with an X and Y input. So we're gonna take our X and we're gonna add movement input and we want this to be based upon the forward vector of our player character. So this is gonna be handling the up and down movement. Then we have our Y value, and we're gonna do this based upon the right vector of our control rotation. And this will add movement horizontally in the level. And this is pretty basic. And I think if you look in some of the Unreal Engine examples, they have a very similar implementation. So you can use this in any top-down type game where you want the player to be able to move around using WASD or a control pad. The next thing is Fire Cannon, and we didn't really change anything here, although I did set up a Niagara Particle system to spawn a muzzle flash, and we're also spawning a sound when we fire the cannon. And then in our cannon ball, I just changed out the sphere that we were using and added a particle system. And I think this just makes it a little bit more interesting for the player. Our damage function, we really didn't change. So this was how it was previously, but we did set up an interact system that's very similar to the one that we set up in our haunted house game. The only difference is we're using on begin overlap and on end overlap to set our interacting actor and show or hide the interact widget. And that's pretty much all the changes that we made to our tank. Another big change to the game though, is the implementation of wave-based spawning. And right here in begin play, after we create our map, we're gonna set starting player view, which is going to take the player character and the spring arm. We're gonna set the arm length to 500 and set the relative rotation to zero, minus 20, and minus 195. And that gives us that low view to the player character that's much closer. Then we're gonna set a timer on this function called rotate player view. And all this is doing is just taking the current rotation, we're gonna add one to the Z, and then set that to the new rotation. And this is being called 20 times per second to give the effect that we're rotating around the player. In the main menu, we have this start game button. And when we click this button, all we're gonna do is get our game mode and call start game. In BP game mode, this event is going to clear that timer. So we're gonna stop rotating around the player. We're gonna show HUD. We're gonna create a new widget called countdown, which is handling that countdown function. And then the rest of this is handling that lerp from wherever the camera is to the location that we want it to be during gameplay. So we're gonna get player character and get the spring arm, get relative rotation, and then set that to starting rotation. Then we have a timeline that's going to be lerping between 500 and 2000 for our arm length of our spring arm. And it's gonna be lerping between whatever that starting rotation is and zero minus 60 zero, which is the angle of the spring arm during gameplay. So all of this is just handling the lerping after the player selects start game. When this lerp is finished, we're gonna call another event called start new wave. And we'll be using start new wave to start each wave in the game. So we're going to set mouse crosshair, and this is going to take our player character, set is in menu, 
which gives us the ability to move around the character. We're gonna create a widget called crosshairs, and then we're gonna set that to the mouse cursor widget of crosshairs. And then we're going to set current mouse cursor to crosshairs. We wanna show mouse cursor, and then we're going to set input mode to game and UI. And one important thing to click here if we want to use this is we want to deselect hide cursor during capture. This means that the crosshairs widget will always be showing even when the player is pressing the mouse. Next, we're gonna have this function called wave parameter setup. And you could create some additional functionality here. What I'm doing is I just have a simple math equation that's going to get our current wave number and we're gonna do some math to get how many bugs we want to spawn, and then we'll clear all the bugs that are in the array. Then we'll call this event dispatcher called call start wave, which will send out a message to all the other actors to let them know that the wave has started. Then we'll delay two seconds just to give the player a little bit of time to prepare for the starting wave. And then we'll do what we were doing before, set timer by function name, of spawn bug and our spawn timer is set now to one second. Spawn bug is going to select a random bug and then we'll spawn actor. And the way it was before is we were just finding a circle around the tower. What I wanted is the ability to spawn a bug at any floor location in the map. This prevents a, a few bugs like a bug being spawned inside of a wall or into an area where they wouldn't be able to move around or even in some cases where you had a smaller map, it could spawn the bug off the map. So I created a new function called get random bug spawn location. And in here, we're just getting that floor array where we were setting all those floor locations when we were creating the map. We're gonna get a random element of that array. We're gonna get the world location and get the X and Y value and leave the Z at zero. And then we'll spawn actor into the level. Then I'm gonna cast a BP bug and to get that reference and add it to this bugs array. I'll get remaining bugs to spawn, which is the variable that we set up when we were setting our wave parameters. And I'm going to decrement it and then check if it's equal to zero. And if it is, then we'll clear timer by function name of spawn bug, which means when we have the number of bugs that we wanted for this wave, we'll stop spawning new ones into the level. So that's handling starting the wave, but we also need to know when the wave is complete. So here on my BP bug, when the bug is destroyed, we had this function called death processing. And in here, I've made a few changes. I added a montage so we can see the bug dying. I turned off the collision so that we could shoot through dead bugs, stop moving immediately, disable movement on our character movement component. And then I'm gonna cast to BP game mode and add to score, spawn some loot, and then spawn a sound of the bug dying. This add to score function on BP game mode increments the number of bugs squash, removes the killed bug which we passed in from the bugs array, and then we wanna check if the bugs array is greater than zero, we'll do nothing. But if it isn't, which means it's zero or less, then we'll call wave complete. And wave complete will just call wave complete dispatcher, which sends out a message to the various actors in our game that the wave has been completed. And that's handling all of the wave-based behavior of our game. But when the wave is completed, we go into this other mode of play where the player can interact with the tower and other towers in the game. And part of this is that when we interact with this tower, we can press E to interact. And then if we have the number of credits required, we can select by tower and this changes the view and we can move around the viewport and wherever our cursor is, there's this little glowing actor that shows us where we're gonna spawn the tower. And if I select a location, the turret is spawned and I move back to the player. So let's talk through what's happening in this tower menu. When we press the start wave button, we're just gonna cast to our BP game mode and we're gonna call start new wave and then remove from parent the tower menu. And we already went over what start new wave does, but there's this second button that's called by tower. And if we look at this, we can see what's going on here. So in BP game mode, we're getting access 
to a component called BP Bank, which we've set up here on our BP game mode. And this is very similar to what we set up in our Space Fighter game. The only difference is we're putting it on the game mode this time. So we have one variable called currency, and then we have three functions, our funds available, remove funds and add funds. Our funds available just takes an input of amount and checks if our current currency is greater than or equal to and returns a bool. Remove funds will take an input of amount and subtract that from our currency and set that as the new currency and add funds just does the opposite. So here in our tower menu, we're checking our funds available and we're passing in tower costs, which I've set to 750. If the funds are available, we're gonna call switch to build mode and then remove this tower menu widget from the viewport. Switch to build mode is going to spawn an actor of type BP camera, and we're gonna pass in that tower cost. And then we wanna possess the camera. So this is what's allowing us to switch between those two views. And then after we possess, we're just gonna hide the interact widget on our HUD. In BP camera, we wanna set some different functionality to the controls. So I've used the enhanced input action of IA move. And what I'm doing is I'm getting the world location of my default route. And then I'm taking the X and Y value and I'm just adding or subtracting to those and setting world location. And this is what allows me to move around the camera when I'm in build mode. And this camera movement speed is set to 20 and this just allows us to adjust the speed of how fast the camera can move in the scene. I also have this possessed event, which will be called when we possess this BP camera actor. And here we're setting the input mode to game and UI and we're spawning an actor of tower base. And this is what allows us to have that glowing actor in the scene as we're trying to show where the new tower will be spawned. We're going to set that as a variable and then I'm just going to hide the widget of this so that we don't see the widget when we're placing the new turret. Now we can move the mouse around the screen and it will move that tower spawn location with it. So to do that, I'm using the event tick and I'm using this same function we used earlier, get hit result under cursor by channel. And I'm checking first to make sure that we're actually interacting with something. If it is, I'll get the result of the hit actor and I'll cast it to BP floor to see if there's actually a floor underneath my mouse cursor. And if it is, I'm going to set this to a variable called floor and then set the world location of our tower spawn to the location of that floor. And this allows that new tower spawn to follow around the cursor. When I want to place the actor in the level, I can press the left mouse button which will call the fire cannon input action. And the first thing I'm doing is calling a function called check game mode. And here I'm casting the game mode and I'm getting my floor array. And what I wanna do is I wanna check to see if, if that actor of floor that we're currently hovering over is still in the array. If it is, I'll set it to a local variable. And then when that's complete, if my local variable is not null, then I'll get the floor and remove it from the floor array and then call remove funds on our BP bank. Then I'm gonna get the location of floor, which again, we're setting down here on the tick. I'm gonna spawn BP turret. Then I'm gonna destroy the actor of tower spawn, get actor of class of BP tank base, repossess it, and then destroy BP camera. So all of this is what's allowing us to swap to the camera, create a tower, and then swap back to the player's tank. So the next thing is to talk about BP turret. So I created another actor called BP turret and it's of type tower base. And in here, we just have a few things. Most notable, we have this mess, which is the base of the tower. And then we have a turret with several other items nested underneath it. And essentially what I wanted was that when the turret rotates, we rotate where the turret is going to fire a bullet. So here in begin play, we're calling the parent activity, which in this case is just setting up some boilerplate code on tower base. We're creating the widget that shows the health of the tower and setting game mode. Then we call AI handling. Now AI handling will start by doing find target. 
And this is really similar to the find target that we use on our BP chaser in Space Fighter. We're going to get all actors of class BP bug, and we're going to find the closest bug to the turret and then set that as the target. And then if target is valid, we'll call set timer by function of start firing. If it's not valid, meaning it didn't find a bug within the range, we'll wait half a second and then we'll call AI handling again. Start firing is going to check that that target is valid and that it is not dead. And then it's gonna spawn a cannonball at the location of the muzzle. And then it's gonna create a sound of the cannon being fired and then call AI handling again. So this is what's allowing the turrets to target bugs and fire the cannon at them. And down here, we're just setting the rotation of the turret. So we're getting our target. If it's not valid, we do nothing. But if it is, we get the location of the target and then we get the location of the turret and we find look at rotation and set the world rotation on the Z of our turret to that find look at rotation. And this is what allows the turrets to rotate to look at their target so that they're firing a bullet in the correct direction. The last thing I wanna go over is the updates that we made to the BP bug. So you can see, first of all, I've inputted some bug assets. I found this stylized Beatles pack on the marketplace. It's made by this company called Enhanced Studio. All of their assets are really high quality stylized assets. And you can see that there's a variety of Beatles in this pack and they're all high quality stylized assets. And I thought this would be really fun to use in a game called Bug Squash. Now this is not a free asset, so you don't need to buy it. You could try to find something else for your bugs, but I got this during a Black Friday sale and it was pretty cheap, so I thought it was worth buying. I set up an animation state machine. It's pretty basic. There's an idle, there's a walk, there's a dead, and then there's a flying. So on begin play, we're gonna set the health, we're gonna get the spawn location and set that to a location, and then we'll call this event called spawn in. And this spawn in function is what's going to allow the bugs to look like they're up in the air and they're flying into the level. And I thought this just added a fun little flair to our game. So there's this spawn offset function, which is just getting kind of a RAM location based upon spawn location. And we're adding 750 to the Z, so it looks like it's a little bit higher. And then we get the spawn rotation, so we're getting our world location and our spawn location, and we're getting a look at rotation. And then we get our world location and set that as starting location. And then we're just going to do this timeline, which is going to lerp between our starting location and our spawn location and set world location. So this is gonna allow it to have the look that it's flying into the level. When this is complete, we'll set movement mode to walking and we'll call AI handling. On all of our bugs, this is gonna be pretty much the same, but you could set up different behavior for different bugs if you wanted a more dynamic experience. Here, we're gonna to check to make sure that this bug is still alive. We're gonna find closest target, which is going to, which is going to take the tank base and all of the towers and add them to a target's array. Then once the array is full, we'll look through the array and find the closest target and set that to closest target. And then we'll take closest target and set it to target. Then we'll call AI move to of target. If it fails, meaning it's blocked by something, we'll just wait a little bit and then we'll call AI handling again. But if it does get there, we'll do play animation montage of an attack montage and then we're gonna wait one second and call AI handling again. So when bugs get to their location, they'll continue to try to either attack it or to move closer to another target. And that's pretty much all the AI on our bugs. And that also wraps up all the changes that we made to bug squash. So I know we covered a lot. I hope you were able to get some ideas for your own project. I think with a few more changes, this would be a great portfolio piece or even something we could release as a complete game. I'd love to see what you did for your project. So if you had fun with this project, please head to my Discord and send me an update of what you did in your game. I would love to see some inputs from the community. In the next lesson, we're gonna talk through some changes that I made to our haunted house game 
And one of the big ones that I thought was important for that game or any survival horror type game is the ability to pick up items that are found in the world and have an inventory where the player could swap between items. So we'll set that up as part of that project and I'll see you in the next lesson.